Join me as I talk with people who express their creativity in ways that can inspire the rest of us to recognize our own creativity. And if you enjoy these conversations, please like, subscribe, and share them. Hello, and welcome to Creativity Conversations. This is episode 39, and I have the pleasure of talking with Sarah Sylvester. Sarah, welcome. It's great to have you here. Nina, it's so lovely to speak to you, and it's so great of you to welcome me on your lovely podcast. Oh, well, thank you. We'll have some fun, I'm sure. Mm. On these calls, we take a maybe a sideways glance at the nature of creativity and how it shows up in different lives for different people. And we have a little bit of an unusual background with Sarah. And Sarah has now, since late last year, been a full-time writer. And she came out of a corporate background where, as you might guess, uh, many women are subjected to a male-dominated industry, and this was the same thing that happened with Sarah. Her experience um, as a very dedicated individual was to overwork herself to the point of having a breakdown in public. And after that, she spent a good bit of time really rethinking her life. And, and Sarah, you'll tell me if there's a different way to express that. Uh, and since last year, she has been devoting herself to writing on a full-time basis. So we're going to talk with Sarah and just see how all of this happened and what she sees now that's different and that has given her the opportunity to express what she refers to as her unique voice. So Sarah, let's see what happens. Oh, Nina, I'm looking forward to that. And that's a great place to start in terms of that unique voice. Because I think one of the things for me that I always had on my mind was the fact that I was broken and battered and, and alone in the world. And who would ever want to listen to my voice because it wasn't good enough or I wasn't worth enough. And coming from an industry that demanded results on an hourly, if not daily basis, I was very much drowning in that world of I have to do more and be more, where that whole unique voice of Sarah was never allowed to blossom as beautifully and as freely as it does every day now on a blank page. It's just a wonderful feeling. I'm sure many people hearing that would love to have that experience as well. <laughs> So you came from a background where you were in banking and then you were in education and then you were in the automotive industry in a business to business context. Tell me a little bit about what that was like and whether even in those places, a little bit more restricted than some, you would see creativity showing itself either through what you were able to create or what you saw in general. That's a really great question. And I think in, in banking to start with, I, I started off in banking in the early 90s and it was very much about, um, I suppose, seeing people, meeting people, greeting people. And I think the creativity that I saw in those early days, given the fact that I was probably in my early 20s at that point, late teens, was almost that community spirit that I was introduced to. And community spirit might not sound all that creative, but for me, it was just that beautiful blend of, of, of seeing people come in, they, were, they, were, they wanted a, a service, they wanted something done for them. But to connect with somebody, and, and I think that's where I got my early glimpse and flavor of that connectedness that drove me through the rest of my career because you hear people get interviewed and they say oh I just love working with people and then you go into an industry where it's results over people and it's targets over people and it's everything else despite people but I think in 
business how I, and the way in which I see it, the people are the things that are most important and they're the people that drive the creativity in everything that we do because it's, and I'd even go so far as to say that creativity and diversity are a little bit closely linked as well because if you surround yourself in an industry with people who are like-minded to you, so they, they know the same things as you, they've got the same opinions as you, it's almost like creativity is stifled in that sense because who wants to be surrounded by people who think the same way and do the same things and have the same opinions and all these yes people, you know, the, the types that you, you line up in front of your boss, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir. And it's like, there's just no creativity that sits anywhere close to that. And there's, I think in my early stages, it was all of working. It was that people aspect that I hooked onto and saw something in that. And I think that's what then drove me into a career in sales. I just really love talking to people. And I know that sounds really daft, but I just loved having conversations with people. And sometimes to the, to the detriment sometimes of my sales figures, because it'd be like, well, you need to close deals faster. And I was like, I've got no interest in closing deals as much as I have in terms of building connection with people. And seeing the world flipped on its head in terms of results over people, I just, I don't know, I just don't get it. And I found it very, very frustrating. So what did you see or come to see with that love of connecting with people? How do you see that or, or did you see it back then as an aspect of a creative process? I didn't see it back then as a creative proce um, process, no, because it really buttered heads with that sales target driven world that I found myself in because I think I probably fell into sales accidentally because it was like, you like talking to people, people like you. I mean, the age old adage, people buy from people rather than um, a business, that age old adage. But I didn't see the, the link to creativity back then because I almost, gosh, I don't know what the word is. I almost shied away from it or I almost found it and I want to use the word abhorrent, or I almost found it disgusting that, that, that creativity was something that would stop me from achieving something. Whereas now it's completely the opposite. And it was almost like, I've not got time for any of this flowery, flouncy rubbish. I just need to get down to the brass tacks and sell my stuff and reach my targets and all of this. And it's like, it's so much different now. I see it so much differently because there's that natural energy flow of life that people don't work according to um, targets and achievements that have to be ticked off because everybody's achievements are different. Everybody's level and perception of success is different. And what is successful for one person isn't necessarily their definition of success. And when you relax into that creative space, I think that's where the magic starts to happen a little bit because there's just this curious exploration. And I do, Nina, you know, I call it the, the possibility of a blank page. It's that opening my journal up every day and feeling that nervous energy that I get every time I stare at a blank page. And it, courses through my veins every day when I do it but it's just and I've got goosebumps now just talking about it I just absolutely love it because that is the epitome of me of me of, of creative genius creative flow creativity and I shied away for that from that for so many years because I thought that was the opposite of what life was all about can you explain that a little bit more when you say you thought it was the opposite? Tell, tell me more about that, because I'm curious how you see it. Yeah, I thought that 
the purpose, if I take my analogy of a blank page, I thought my purpose in life was to fill the page and the page had to be filled constantly. And with I had to, with, with anything, with, with absolutely anything. And that's the whole point. It's like with absolutely anything, I had to be on the go. Doesn't matter what was being produced, but it just had, something had to be produced and it was constant. So my aim in life, or I thought my aim in life was to fill the page. And if I didn't fill the page, that's it. I'd be kicked off the planet because I'm not a proper human. You know, the proper humans that are good at stuff rather than those that just sit with a blank page and think, oh, wow, give it to me now. And it's just, I thought it was my job to just fill and just, and, but then at the end of the day, it's almost like get your spade out and start digging again. So there's another hole and then there's another page and then you have to fill that one and it's just constant doing rather than the, I suppose you could call it wisdom or you could call it grace. I don't know what you call it, but the beauty that there will always, or something will always come from nothing. So there's always going to be no thing, but something will always come from that and trusting that something will always land. And it's not down to me to make it land because it will come through when the time is for it to come through. So nothing or no thing doesn't really mean absence. It, it sounds like the way you're defining it is nothing is nothing is the entry point that the, it's yeah. actually filled it's it's like the same to, an analogy might be that they used to talk about space outer space being empty but now they say it's full yeah and it sounds like you're saying something very similar oh absolutely nini you've you, you've got that spot on it's almost like the definition of silence for me silence isn't nothing it's like silence is plentiful there's beauty and gr and gorgeousness in silence and it's the same things with, with no thing and it is the entry point it's like that almost that neutrality and the things that cropped, in my, cropped up in my mind when you were talking there was the possibility the fact that everything is up for grabs and also the the warm cuddle that you get where you know that something will always come from that space of no thing and no matter what that something is first of all it's not down to you to create that something you don't have to produce it because it will be produced it will develop it will it will come through you and, and despite you because of you but you're absolutely right no thing is an absence and that's where I think I got it a little bit I suppose upside down because if I saw myself creating nothing or being nothing or having nothing to show for my day and bear in mind being in a sales background and working in a very um, macho and masochistic organization, having to prove yourself constantly and even prove, and again, work twice as hard. And I got told that work twice as hard because you're a woman, you have to produce things all of the time. And it was like, if I didn't, then I would be failing, not realizing the beauty in no thing. And it is, it's just rest in it, bathe in it, look at it and smile at it because it, com it comes through you. It's that trust bit, it's that wisdom bit. And I love that. Yeah, that's lovely. So... I know that you've shared with me that you came to a, a crisis point. Can you share that with the rest of us who are listening and eager to hear about what happened before and after? Yeah, absolutely. Um, working in automotive, um, very busy organization. I had been, relatively speaking, quite senior in that industry, um, promoted probably four or five times in the space of just as many years. And I was operating at the speed of my thinking, my personal thinking. So what was going on in my head, that's how I was operating at. And 
we all know how many thoughts we have spinning around our brains on a, on a, on a minute to minute, moment to moment basis. Well, I grab onto, or I try to grab onto all of them and do something about them constantly. And that led to me not eating, not sleeping, not looking after myself and just working constantly because I was under the illusion that again, it was down to me to achieve. And what I wanted to achieve, I had absolutely no idea because the minute I achieved this self-imposed achievement, it would move, it would move and it would move. And I was really good at my job. And given how great I was at my job, I would be given more to do. It's like, again, the age old adage, you want something done, give it to a busy person. Because <laughs> everybody that's, that's busy is obviously dedicated. So it reached a bit of a crisis point in the summer of 2019 where I didn't know what to do. And that sounds really odd because I was doing a lot, but nothing that I was doing was making sense. I was almost, if I did sleep, I was holding my breath all the time. I wasn't even allowing myself time to breathe. I was like, you can't breathe. You can't, no, you can't breathe. And I was like stopping the flow of natural life. And it was just, it was horrible. I look back now and I want to give that girl a great big cuddle. I really do, because poor thing. And and what you're describing is so common in the, in the corporate world. It's just... Oh. Absolutely. Endemic to the content. Anybody who's feeling like that, I've got massive amounts of empathy and compassion because you don't know how to get out of it. I knew that I was very poorly. My family knew I was very poorly. But because I was confused and unwilling to accept or I thought asking for help was a complete no, no. Saying that I was unwell or, or needed some support meant that I'd failed. Um, I was looking after a team of people, so they were looking up to me for support, couldn't possibly look weak or, I mean, all these words, weak, vulnerable, would just, I'd just cringe. I really would. And anybody that would challenge me, my husband was obviously the, the championer of this, I would be awful to him, absolutely awful. And I was, I was a horrible human being for a number of years because I was almost pushing people away because I was on self-destruct mode and I was destroying myself and, and how I came to exist, right? I suppose feeding right up to the day of the breakdown. I've got no idea how I managed to keep upright. No idea. But it's, it's interesting you talk about creativity and maybe that wisdom that's at play it's almost like I saw something at play that said you need to put down Sarah otherwise we're going to put you down and it's almost that if you're not going to do it yourself something is going to intervene and do it for you because right now this ain't life love <laughs> it's just not <laughs> You've got so much more to give the world. You've got so much more in terms of special gifts that you're just not able to see right now. So put the brakes on, love, and just take a moment. And yeah, it was a horrible experience, Nina. It was horrible and it was very public. Um, if anybody's had a panic attack, they'll know what I'm talking about. And it was very very serious panic attack I was I wanted to throw a chair out of a first floor window and follow it that's where I was at um and the people around me because it was so I suppose drastic because I put on a very good mask I was brilliant at hiding excellent at it so it was so drastic. One minute you've got strong corporate kick-ass Sarah who didn't take any crap from anybody. Next minute you've got Sarah hiding in an office, a sniveling wreck, waiting to pick up a chair and throw it out the window. You're like, what the hell's going on here? And the people around me didn't know how to react either. And I think there is still in my mind a bit of a stigma around um, that reaction and that people opening up because I think there's probably a lot of people still out there that won't ask for help because they don't know how to 
no idea how to say that first word. I need help. Help me, please help me, whatever. I don't, and, and for me, it was, I don't know what to do. That's why I kept shouting out loud. And again, everybody was like, she's gone a bit cuckoo. And it was just that kind of, it was that desperation. And I think in the days after, I didn't speak for four days after. I mean, I, you say speak, do you want a cup of tea? Yes. Are you hungry? Yes. It's time for bed. Great. Go brush your teeth. Okay. But I didn't communicate. I was lost the ability to do so. But what I saw after was my probably first insight into creativity, because when I came to a grounding halt, all kinds of cool stuff started to happen. words started to come to me phrases and stories and kind of ideas and oh, just things that I'd never thought of before and wouldn't even have, have dreamed of before just started to come to me because my mind was starting to slow down so do you think I'm going to jump in for a second to interrupt you do you it's occurring to me as you say this that one of the aspects of creativity, you know, we always talk about fresh ideas and solutions, and yet it sounds like with what you're saying, one aspect of creativity is making room, whether it's <laughs> by your own volition or otherwise. Oh, God, yeah. It's interesting because it's like I asked myself the question before we spoke, is creativity something that we have to earn or is it in us all? Is it like in, it's, it's like that nature versus nurture kind of argument that we all hear. Are we all born creative or do we have to be learn how to be creative? And for me, it is that making room because I think creativity lives in us all the time. We have got an innate, I think anyway, an innate ability to create because we have got fresh thought happening all the time. Every second of every day, there's something fresh that's coming. Whether we allow that freshness, and the way in which I describe it is surprise. So, and, and that's what I noticed when I slowed down. Oh my God, surprise, oh, where did that come from? And that, if you allow that surprise room to grow and room to develop and room to be and room to sit and room to just, will be seen rather than just stamping it on the head and going you don't belong here get out <laughs> and and in a, in a crowded market it's really difficult for a, a tiny little voice a tiny little grain of sand to be seen but it's all part of the same beach it's just it, it just is but there's so many grains of sand that make the whole beach and I just think it's beautiful that we need to make room for all of them So fast forward, and then we can go backwards again. <laughs> you uh, have a podcast that you do with your husband, and you yeah. write a book. Yes, I, I do. Uh, well, I suppose first of all came the podcast, then came the book. Um, I was exploring this fresh understanding that, that, that I had and that mentors and people around me had, had helped me to, I suppose, make sense of how human beings work. And as part of my, I suppose I want to call it recovery, but I suppose you know what I'm getting at. As part of the way in which I see myself in the world now, I was just getting really curious. And then that had a knock on effect to my husband and my daughter. I mean, she's 18, she's in her first year at university. Um, and there was that curiosity. And we happened to be chatting about something and nothing. And, and Martin, my husband, happened to say to me, yeah, Sarah, but what's really going on? And that was the curiosity for me. It's like sometimes we're so busy operating at such a walloping speed that we take what we think, what we feel at, at face value, we believe it all, we create story, we get on the narrative bus, we drive full pelt ahead, we get in a pit of despair and we're veering all over the place, we're down a motorway, we're off a junction, but we don't ever stop to realise, well, what's really going on? 
are the stories that we tell ourselves really all that true or the illusion that we find in ourselves really all that and we just have we started having me and martin these really cool conversations and i was coming at it from a maybe a, an understanding perspective of the three principles and martin was coming at it as a complete outsider he's done a, a master's degree in workplace health and well-being and he works in the corporate world <clears throat> And we just thought, why don't we record a few episodes, just me and him having a bit of a chat. And it's just been really great, again, to have that natural flow of conversation where you've got no idea where it's going to end up. You know, that meandering kind of openness, like you've got no agenda, no reason in the world why you started it and no reason why in the world where you, you would ever end it. And I love that because... Again, if you talk about creativity, something so surprising can crop up out of that. Oh, God, I didn't see it like that. Wow. And it can take you off in a completely different direction. And I love that, that the path of life is just not as restrictive and straight as I once thought it was. Yeah. Do you think that it's necessary? Well, it's not necessarily desirable, but do you think that... What do you think, besides having a breakdown, helps people to come to that awareness that life doesn't have to be on this very strict highway with very particular exits and entrances? Oh, gosh, what a great question. Well, the first word that jumped into my head when you asked that question, Nina, was hope. Mm. Because in the early stages, apart from the breakdown hope embraced me I didn't have any answers and given the fact that I worked in a world that needed answers on a daily basis I was lost for words in terms of answers I have not <clears throat> but hope took over there and just gave me a big cuddle and said you don't need to know just hold on you might be holding on by the skin of your little fingernails but don't worry I'm going to embrace you for a minute and I think for anybody to see that there's hope in everything and for me it was you don't have to believe everything you think as well that was a huge game changer for me because yeah. I believed it all <laughs> well I, I totally get what you're saying because isn't it true for pretty much all of us that we are, are, are especially our scary thinking can, the, mm -hmm. the thinking that says we can't do this, we're not allowed to do this, we shouldn't do this, it's not acceptable, it's not respectable, whatever our uh, roadblocks are, I guess I'm, I'm still going with the, the, <laughs> the highway analogy. Yeah. And yet, I, I love that you're using that idea of hope and of surprise because wouldn't you say that most of the world we live in, whether it's externally driven or internally driven, is set on a basis of certain prescribed ways of doing things and that other ways of doing things are not even remotely acknowledged? I would absolutely sign up for that because that was the way in which my world was working constantly. Like you have to follow a prescribed path and there's no deviation from that. And it's almost like the vision that came into my mind, just to follow the highway analogy again, it's like I'd be speeding down the motorway, full speed ahead, like 18 miles an, 80 miles an hour. And life would be set on the side of the road going, hello, I'm over here. And you'd be missing it because you'd be speeding past it. And who knew, and if I could call my breakdown a roadblock, who knew that that roadblock was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because it veered me off a path. And there's nothing, and again, there's, I'm going to say this is going to sound really weird, but there's nothing wrong with veering. And that's how I saw it, completely the opposite. It's, it's like a sat-nav. Do you want to pick the quickest, the fastest, or the most scenic? It's like, well, I'll probably take the most scenic every day of the week and twice on a Sunday because it's like, why wouldn't you want to be surprised by your journey? Because you might end up not 
being at the end of the journey that you thought you were going to be on because you end up on another one. And that's how I ended up with writing, definitely, and, and doing writing full time. I never thought I was going to be a writer and still sometimes now. I say the words I'm a writer and internally cringe. It's like that kind of, oh, did I say that out loud? Oh, let me take that back. Because oh. <laughs> self-doubt creeps in. Yeah. Who knew that I could say, I've got a book. It's going to be out on Kindle on the 1st of May. I've sent some copies to my nearest and dearest. I've had some really good feedback. I'm writing every day still. I've got another one just about planned already. And I love, love, love writing. I mean, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> who knew? So if you could give me three other words that you would use as aspects of creativity, what might they be? Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Well, that was a good you, one. <laughs> yeah, wow. I've used surprise, haven't I? Um, there's something about organic that jumps out at me. And I don't know whether it's because organic points to the natural aspect of it. It's almost that non-manufactured essence of of creativity mm. there's no manufacture to it because yeah natural or organic that would be something and also um <laughs> this word's going to make you laugh i'm going to say it anyway i don't care flabby you know that kind of rotund kind of flabby kind of hanging over the side of your jeans kind of thing <laughs> where it's just it's Up and just top. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> because creativity flows in all kinds of ways. We don't have to suck our stomachs in and we don't have to kind of kind of pose in a certain way so you don't get the double chin and all of those kind of things. It's that kind of creativity for me is flabby. It's all a bit kind of hanging around the edges because it's just, and it probably points to that natural beauty as well. So, so yeah, apologies for the flabby reference. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think for for many of us that it's a relief. I don't have to hold it in. No, I don't have to hold it in. And that's the whole point. You don't have to hold it in. And for anybody like me who's been in the restrictions of lockdown and, and been munching on Easter eggs and uh, lots of carbs <laughs> and wearing joggers all day. <laughs> But yeah, you don't have to hold it in. It's that flabby aspect of it. And I think another word, if, if I may add another one, would be probably fluid. Mm. It's, it's like a really good can of Coke. You know, that kind of... Um, Are you talking about Coca-Cola? Co yeah, Coca-Cola. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Coca-Cola. Yes, Coca-Cola. It's like a really good can of Coca-Cola. Do you know when you get hold of it and it's icy on the outside and it's 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 you can just fit it in your hand and then you pop the cap and you hear that hiss and it's like oh just love it and then the cap gets popped and you take that very first taste and that sweetness hits the back of your mouth and then you just swallow it and you're like thirst refreshing great I can't drink it too fast because otherwise you get cold head and you get that kind of cold feeling in your teeth where you can't quite swallow it's like eating ice cream you know that kind of cold head feeling but it's like a really good yeah I can't believe I've just said that Nina apologies a really good can of coca-cola <laughs> that's how I describe creativity <laughs> effervescent yes that's such a nicer way of putting it rather than my scrappy description no, I like it I like it it, it uh, points to a certain willingness to take that first sip yeah, most definitely that first sip and that feeling that you get when you swallow that fizzy drink for the first time where it hits every sense that you've got. It hits your taste buds in the back of your throat and your eyes and you, you feel it everywhere in your body. And I love that feeling of 
and again refreshing refreshment and again probably completely butchering my coke color analogy but that feeling of refreshment that's how i'd see well you were terrific as an advertising copywriter for coca-cola <laughs> but you know the thing that i hear you saying that i i'd love to spend a couple of minutes talking about is that uh, creativity is a a full body experience right? oh, yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah I love that and it is it's um we've all got our own feelings when we know we know we're onto something and for me living in a world of I suppose circumstances allowing the world to um, me living my world according to my circumstances rather than what was going on internally it was that feeling of I suppose restriction and closed in and given the fact I didn't particularly look after my body very well again wasn't eating wasn't sleeping constantly unwell I know the feeling now when I'm on to the truth and when I say truth I mean the truth of how the world works and how I operate during the course of the day. And we, I think we've all got that feeling, you know, that, and I mentioned it earlier about that, that goosebump feeling, you know, when you're onto it and you feel like, Oh, that's good. And the hairs on the back of your, your neck stand up or you get the arms and you get the goosebumps and you get that. And I didn't realize, again, you talk about full body experience, how much tension I held in my face. And just that feeling of complete and utter relaxation in the face. And it just then almost, there's a cascading feeling, a wash of warmth that runs through your entire body from tip to toe. Yeah. And it's just such a beautiful, and again, it's like, it's, it's beautiful because you know that you're not doing it. Right. You can't make yourself have goosebumps. No, no, you can't. You can't make yourself have goosebumps. You can't make yourself have that kind of like the feeling that you get when you scrunch your face and then you just go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and that feeling of just that refreshing feeling you get. And like you say, you can't make yourself have goosebumps. Yeah. And I love, love, love that because it's a, you're right, it's a full body experience. It also makes me think about how so many of us have lived and sometimes still do in um, the world of our own thinking. You know, it's as though we have, you know, those stick figures that, that people draw with the really big head and then the little <laughs> sticks for arms and legs. It's that we're up here and we with so much of our lives you know like what are we supposed to be doing and how are we supposed mm -hmm. to do it and are we doing it well enough and always mm -hmm. comparing ourselves and then judging ourselves and then ping-ponging back and forth between that and yet I think there's a growing um, invitation now but I think it's really important especially in terms of creativity is to acknowledge the wisdom of our bodies and case in point, when your body was telling you, don't mm. go in this direction, you're getting too close to the edge, and you weren't able at that point until you were to, to acknowledge that, and it came out the way it did. But so many of us forget that our bodies have wisdom and our bodies are talking to us all the time, like this feels good, notice this, do that, open up, see the sky, look at the trees mm -hmm. listen to the birds and then our bodies respond it's not that they're inert matter they ha it has an intelligence to it yeah yeah there's two things that cropped up while you were talking about that nearly absolutely spot on was that the first one is that almost like warning signal mm -hmm. and one of the things that the warning signal that i misinterpreted before my breakdown and even a little bit afterwards misinterpreted was the warning signal is just true because the warning signal just tells me that i'm i'm on to something yes because i'm anxious so the warning signal you, you you feel anxious you feel more anxious the warning signal is telling you you're anxious that must mean i'm anxious and it's just it, it and the warning signal was feeding feeding into it 
and one of the things that I noticed then was all the warning signal was doing was my body's wisdom telling me, you know what, Sarah, you're just believing a load of crap right now. We're, we're flashing this warning signal to you because you've, you're feeding off all of this crap. Hello, warning signal over here. Don't believe that. Drop your spade and just don't believe it. But the warning signal is there to almost that body's wisdom of helping us and guiding us. But when we don't pay attention to it, we can almost believe that it's it's the truth. And it's not all it is is a warning signal. And I think the other thing that's really cool about, I suppose, the body experience is, oh gosh, I don't know how to say this. It's like, we're always going to be okay. We can't stop ourselves from breathing. We can't stop ourselves from thinking. And it's like, we, we can't stop gravity from happening. And it's almost like that, I don't know what I'm saying here, it's almost like, it's not about us. It's like there's something else at play here. There's something else in operation here that the body will always do what the body does best. And if we care for it and look, look after it and, and we are the body and we are not the body and I probably don't know what I'm pointing to, but I hope I'm making some sense somewhere, but it's that the wonder of the physical form because there's so much outside of the physical form, I suppose, the form and the formless. Mm. Yeah. And there's, I, I think the way I, I hear what you're saying is that there is an intelligence beyond the intellect. Yes. Yeah. And that intelligence to me, and I'd love to know what you think, is is that formless no thingness, that, that world of all possibility yet to be expressed in whatever form wants to show up and at a given moment. Yeah. Yeah. That was such a more lovely way of putting it, Nina. <laughs> it was really was. Well, you gave <laughs> me the jumping off point. Word, so I should thank I'm, you. I'm glad you can take my verbal vomit and make it sound <laughs> a little bit sensible. Oh, but yeah, hardly I, at all. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. That kind of internal guiding system, however you want to explain that one, that there's this natural intelligence and that was definitely what was in play for me in that horrible experience in July of 2019. My body was looking after me. Um, and I've got immense amounts of compassion for anybody who's felt even remotely suicidal and has that overwhelming feeling of Want, not wanting to live anymore because there's a big difference in my mind between not wanting to live and wanting to die and wanting to leave the world and just it's almost like this overwhelming pain of just not wanting to live anymore and I've got immense compassion for anybody who feels that way because for me the body is equipped with a natural I suppose I want to call it a zest for life and I don't mean to belittle anybody who's feeling particularly mm. suicidal but there's a for me there's a natural instinct and a natural zest for life in, a, in all of us regardless and it may be just some scary ass habitual piling in of lots of stuff that's not true that's making you feel otherwise and I've been there and it's horrific but there is that intelligence system that's still at play and I'm I'm still here and I'm glad you are for oh, one thank you. <laughs> thank you. I recently uh, had a conversation with a, a group of women who are in the corporate world uh, with a colleague of mine Lorna Davis and uh we decided the the topic of the conversation should be from the from the yoga mat to the boardroom <laughs> because so many uh and particularly this was a, a group mostly of women but some men were in there as well and they were all wondering how do you take that sense of 
uh, groundedness and well-being and being at peace and feeling like you're you're who you are, you know, you're, you're grounded in, in you and take that into the boardroom where there is uh, pressure and demands and metrics and constant mm. pushing to be more or, or operate in a way that may not be in an alignment with the, what would be a normal way of relating to people, communicating with people, connecting to people. And it seems to me, as we have this conversation, that so many of us don't realize that intelligence, not only of the body, but our own, as you were putting it, our own wisdom, our in our our guidance, internal guidance system, if you will. Yeah. Both of those are always operating, but when we are so. Um, caught up with, uh, preoccupied with external demands that we forget to listen. Yeah. That's such a lovely way of putting it, Nina, because I think the, the way in which I see it is that that internal wisdom, that guiding system, that the effervescence of magic is like the, the way in which I describe mind is that it's it's effervescently magic and I don't know whether effervescently is a word but I've made it up anyway so there you go I like that. um <laughs> that is constant it will never take a day off it will never go off to a beater on a package holiday it's always there it's always switched on and moods fluctuate feelings fluctuate thought fluctuates it, it, we're in a we're in an upward spiral we're in a downward spiral we're here there we're everywhere but what is constant and real to us, and here come the goosebumps again, is that kind of effervescent magic that is always with us. Regardless of, like you say, that external pull. And one of the things that I would really love for any corporate to see is that if we strip away the preconceived notion that we know what's going to happen because I think in corporate that I experienced we've got a plan to get to we've got a target we've got a business goal a business whatever it may be we've got a five-year plan if we strip away all of that and just treat each meeting and each, each day not like it's the last on earth but it's the first I mean imagine if you just appro approach everything like it's the first time you turned a page and it's your first blank page ever you have nothing that you've brought with you. You've got no baggage, no nothing, no sense of ick. And you've got no memory about, or you've got no projection as to what might happen. So never mind the last day on earth. I hope for everybody that we, they would treat their, every day like it's their first. Why wouldn't you? It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> let's spend a little bit of time talking about your life now as a writer oh what did you say that like? out loud <laughs> <laughs> i did everybody she's a writer <sighs> oh um well my and they call it a chat book so my first chat book and a, a chat book for, for, for anybody who wants a definition of it it's like a mini novel so probably no more than about 50 pages. Um, I wrote my chapbook as part of the entry level class to method writing. And at the end of the eight weeks, you have to produce a, a book. Now I entered method writing to become a better writer. Well, I actually came out of it a better person because I started to see how much, first of all, inspiration is just not where it's at. Creative genius, as, as it's called, flows through you, not because of you. You're not creating anything. And if you show up like we've talked about already and put the work in, and follow the process, 
then product appears. You don't have to have this kind of effort and angst. And I mean, it, I knew the, the phrase writer's block existed and I've had it in myself in the past. I never ever have writer's block ever. It just doesn't, it's because it's not a thing. Why would it be when you just, you just show up and write? And it's jumping over that hurdle of being good. I don't want to be good. I want to have, or I want to speak with my unique voice. My unique voice doesn't care whether it's good or not because it's not a measurement. And that is so far away from what I ever believed in my entire career. That's so like, profound. Say more about that. Because I was always benched in being good or not, reaching targets or not, being better than the person that, that came before me or the person that was going to come after me. And there was almost like a, a hierarchy of goodness. And it's like, oh, let's be the first woman in, in automotive to reach this accolade or achieve this award. And that would make me good. And I achieve, and it's like waking up every day, you know, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you're going, this is my war face. This is like, I'm going to be good today. Arr. It's like good doesn't even come into it anymore because good doesn't even, I, I, I don't want to be good because good isn't creative. Creative's dirty and mucky and icky and surprising and I suppose just completely off the wall, upside down. Yeah, it's just good wouldn't even come into it. So talk about the dirty mucky parts. <laughs> The dirty mucky parts. Well, the dirty mucky parts. I mean, I I write every day, and I have done for well for many many um, months. And I wrote every day after my breakdown. That's what started me on my writing journey. So I would journal. The dirty icky parts are the experiences that I write about, because they're all real to me as I write about them and some of them are very very dirty and very very icky but they don't have to define who I am they don't have to overwhelm me they just have to be experiences and they have to be written in a really good way oh, not a good way but they have to be written in a really unique way with my voice and make sure that my voice is, is heard through them because my voice can sometimes be dirty and icky, but that's okay because that's part of my uniqueness. So when you say dirty and icky, do you mean graphic? Do you mean explicit? Do you, I'm not sure what you mean. No, not that I would say probably, I mean, words that have been used to describe my writing have been harrowing. Ah. So I would say some of the things that I've experienced throughout my life around, um, fertility um I had seven miscarriages ended up having to have a um a, a life-saving operation I had a hysterectomy at the age of 37 um didn't have a particularly great childhood um and obviously suffered with the the the, the, the breakdown but when all of that is said and done, I'm not particularly the only person to experience those things. And, and one of the things that we learn in the method writing is like, your story is boring. <laughs> and when I first heard that, I was like, what do you mean my story is boring? How dare you tell me my story is boring? What do you mean? <laughs> The story of your life is boring. It's how you express it in your own unique voice. It's how you bring it to life through the words that you, you choose to describe your experience. And it's, that's where the creativity comes through because when I sit down with that blank page that I do every day, I'm surprised by what comes out. Every day, bar none. I've got no idea what I'm going to write about. And by the end of writing, I write for about... Um, an hour every day as a 
ambulance goes past the window. Um, I, yeah, I write for about an hour every day, probably between 500 and 1,000 words every day. And the beginning of my process to write, by the end of it, I've got no idea what, how I got there from there. No idea. And I love, love, love that because, yeah, some of it is dirty and icky. So it is harrowing. It's, it's, um, it describes some of the darkest places that I can ever remember from my just over 48 years of life on the planet. But it's, it's, it's wonderful. And I, I love that surprise every day. Sounds to me like you haven't identified with all of those difficult experiences. They happen to you, but they mm -hmm. don't define you and they don't limit you. Mm -hmm. And that to me, <clears throat> excuse me, might be another characteristic of creativity or living a life creatively is not being solely identified with a persona or an objective, but continuously being curious about what's next. And as you say, being cuddled by hope, which is just a, a, a beautiful image, is that that's not only available has not only been available to you, but it's available to all of us. If we just take a step back and hopefully don't get thrown back, but <laughs> with our own volition, let ourselves take a step back and see what else is going on in our lives. As you say, what's really going on. Mm. Yeah, and <clears throat> it, that's a really lovely way of putting it again, because I'm not the only one to have suffered miscarriage. I'm not the only one to have suffered fertility. I'm not the only one that's had a, 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 a really rubbish childhood and, a, and a, a strained relationship with my mother. I'm not, I'm not the only one that's ever had any of that. And none of those things, like you say, define who I am. I've experienced them and I can write from them. And <clears throat> when they cropped up all of them as they did through my writing, it's almost that kind of an again, talking about the icky sticky bit, it's almost like you want to shy away from them. You start writing and you go, oh no, oh no, oh no. And you want to stop. And it's that, almost like, why would you stop that creativity? Why would you stop it as it's just about to flow out of you? And it's like, cringe, but cringe into it. Cringe as you, cringe, cringe, <laughs> cringe in. Don't cringe out, cringe in. And it's like, just and, and what I tend to do when I when I get to that stage and something an image crops up or a story crops up or a, a, a line of dialogue crops up and I feel that kind of <clears throat> I just take a, a bit of a breath and go okay let's just slow it down right now you know what's coming you know but, but almost like it's like give it the space and the room that it deserves because it deserves to be heard and that's I think with the creativity bit it deserves the room that you are going to give it. it. It deserves center stage, if you like, for a moment and just give it, allow it to come through, allow it to be, allow it to have its own unique voice on the page and just slow down with it. And I've written about many harrowing things that have happened to me and I haven't had to ring a therapist and say, I need eight sessions right now because I'm in the pit of despair. Yeah, I felt a bit like, ooh, afterwards, but in a way it's cathartic because it's free, it's freedom, it's unique, it's, it, it, it's that kind of freedom, freedom from the shackles of what you think is going to destroy you. Well, it ain't going to destroy you. Mm. Gorgeous way of putting it. Mm. I was thinking as you were describing it that it's a, you said the word cathartic, but, and, it's freedom once yeah. we, and and this is also very true um, a, a truism in psychology and with other forms of um, ways of, of of freeing ourselves from our past is if we don't hold on to it if we give it the space to be expressed if we embrace it rather than reject it it leaves on its own. <laughs> yeah, 
that's that's spot on. I think throughout my probably my early twenties and maybe my late teens as well, I had this image of and we've all heard the fable about Pandora's box, don't we? Like keeping it closed and not letting it all come out. And I had this image of this locked box that I kept kept hidden under various blankets and kept piling things on top of Pandora's box. And it's just like, oh for God's sake, Sarah, just bust it open. <laughs> it's like it's just bust that thing open and it's almost like it's been poking out for for years it's like little twigs little sticks will poke out and you're like no 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 get back in there get back in there because if you come out you're going to end up destroying me would you it would destroy me and it's like it's that freedom because take a hammer to it and bust that thing open yeah there's going to be some icky ook that's going to pile out of it Icky ook. <laughs> we'll go with it. <laughs> icky ook that's going to pile out of it, but even that icky ook's not going to define who I am. It's just icky ook at the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am sorry to say that we are coming to the close of this conversation. I want to thank you so much and also ask you if you would like, is there anything in particular in addition to what you've shared that you would like to leave us all with? And also, where can people find you? Well, first of all, find me. Um, I'm on Facebook and I have a Facebook page called A Place of Space. And it's where I share some of my kind of wisdom and knowledge around some of the cool things and cool phrases that have cropped up for me. and if you want to drop me an email it's a place of space at icloud.com and like i say my chat book which is entitled miracle angel baby is going to be released on kindle on the 1st of may and i do have some physical hold in your hand copies if you are a, a hold in your hand kind of book person so again just drop me a message for one of those but in terms of being left with something i think always know that you're so much more than you think you are. Creativity is waiting there, waiting to be discovered. It's like a little small child just playing with its train set, just waiting to be discovered and just whisper in its ear and it might have something surprising to say back to you. <laughs> is that our inner child? Yeah, maybe. Else's child. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. That was the image that came to mind. Child playing with a train set, weird. <laughs> oh no, there's something in it. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. I've so enjoyed talking with you today. Oh, thank you, Nina. Thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure to share time with you in space. Mm, and I hope we get to do it again soon. I do too. Take good care. You too. And everyone who's been listening or watching, thank you for spending time with us. And we will see you on the next episode. So bye for now. Take care. Music